Hi, I'm Mitch, and welcome to the Restoration Road here at Huntington University, where my guest is my good friend, Dr. Lance Clark, Associate Dean of the Arts here at Huntington University. Uh, Dr. Clark has an amazing story of faith and how he has implemented that in becoming a storyteller. Uh, his films have reached national acclaim and his students have gone on to do amazing things for the kingdom. You will not want to miss Dr. Lance Clark. Doctor, thank you for being here today. Dr. Cruz, thank you for having me on here. You're the Associate Dean of the Arts at mm -hmm. Huntington University. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I want to talk about how you got into filmmaking and some of the in most incredible projects that you've done. But I want to start with your faith journey. You grew up going to Blackhawk Christian School, is that right? I actually grew up uh, underneath my dad's ministry. He was a pastor for the first 10 years of my life. And then we moved to Fort Wayne, and that's when we started going to Blackhawk at that point. He stepped out of the ministry to start graduate school. Wow. Um, and so counseling. So do you ever remember not being a Christian or did you have a moment? Actually, I did have a walk the sawdust trail in my life. My dad was the type of preacher that would make a call at the end of his sermons to if you want to have that relationship with Jesus, come down here to the altar. And I felt in my heart just pumping one night. I was six years old. It was a Sunday night. They're playing the, my mom's playing the piano. Oh my gosh. And I went forward and, and my dad led me in the sinner's prayer and I accepted Jesus in my life. I was a young man, I was six, but it, but it was real to me at the time. Oh, and, yeah. and it felt very real and as real as a six year old could have that experience, but I knew it was life changing for me. And um, he baptized you too, I assume? My father did baptize me um, a couple years later. Mm. Um, and I had the privilege of having that as well. So. Those were, those were good memories for me. Your dad has gone home to be with the Lord recently, and I bet you've looked in the rearview mirror at that relationship mm -hmm. over your lifetime. Um, what have you um, sensed as those special moments with him? Yeah, uh, he, he recently passed away, and it's been a time of reflection on his ministry. One of the things that he bequeathed me was during the years that he was a pastor, he was in love with technology. Surprise, surprise, the apple hasn't fallen too far <laughs> from the tree. And he had a brand new Sony cassette recorder as a, a young pastor back in the late 60s, early 70s, and recorded all his sermons. So upon his death, I inherited hours of cassette tape sermons of my dad preaching sermons. And so the last few months, I've been transferring them and just hearing my dad talk about different topics and so forth. and really special. He, he actually preached a sermon in October of 1976 about what would heaven be like. And he's basing it out of Isaiah 65. And I took that for the memorial service and shortened that down to a little four minute clip with how great thou art playing in the background. Oh, and it's a man. tear jerker, I'm telling you right now. But oh. it's dad talking about heaven. And he got to speak at his own memorial service. Oh. So pretty special. That is incredible. And I never doubted my dad's love for the Lord, his passion for Jesus. Um, he has his own journey on his life and, and uh, talk about a, a restored journey. He did leave the ministry. Um, he wandered from the faith for a little bit, hmm. uh, made some poor choices as an, as an adult man and left our family and everything. And my parents got divorced and all that. But he came through that. He came back and even when he was a, he stocked groceries at grocery stores, worked at maintenance at Walmart, he did a lot of odd jobs after he left the ministry, Jesus was always on his lips. He always was telling people about Jesus. And you know, a couple weeks ago, I got an email from somebody once he heard about my dad passing, that he said, you know, I stocked shelves with your dad at, in Angola. And he goes, your dad led me to the Lord. Oh my goodness. At three o'clock in the morning one night, and he oh. goes, I'm a pastor down in Muncie now, and you know, your dad touched my life in a way that no other person could at that time. I needed to hear, you know, so it's little stories like that I've heard since he's passed, and. That's incredible. I'm blessed. You are. Um, where did you grow up? Grew up in, the formative years were in Fort Wayne, Indiana. But uh, before, before that, it was Southern Michigan. Okay, so Southern Michigan, mm -hmm. and then you came to Fort mm -hmm. Wayne, and that's where you started attending Blackhawk Christian yes. School? 
Yes. And you encountered Steve Longbreak? Coach Longbreak. He was my basketball coach. Isn't he something? He is. A, he is. <laughs> he was a real mentor in my life and many men's life and young people's lives, even my wife's life. He's incredible. He's been a mentor in my life too. Mm -hmm. He's just incredible. But every time I see him, I call him coach because he was. He still coached to me. Yeah. You know? And uh, he's an amazing man. Most of the faculty or the teachers at Blackhawk, well, they're all outstanding, and um, just was so blessed to have their influence in my life and, and help in my spiritual formation. He picked most of those. Isn't that something? Yeah. He, I, what a team he put together. He's, that's the coach side of him. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. That's incredible. So how did you know that you wanted to do something with filmmaking when you were in high school? Um, when I was in high school, I, we didn't, you know, we, let's go back in some time here, back in our day, right? Uh -huh. So. I had hair. <laughs> I'm we might now. have played basketball against each other, by the way. It's possible. What year did you graduate? 85. And, and I'm 83. Right. And it's possible that I was a freshman in your junior, senior year, because we had, I think we connected in a, in a, anyway. So anyway, so uh, I have always been fascinated with, with technology. My dad was a lover of, of photography. And so I kind of inherited his passion for good picture and storytelling with pictures. I took a trip to Bolivia, South America my, when I was 16 years old. I was one of the first students, and again, this is circa mid 80s, right? Mm -hmm. There weren't the mission trip flavor of the month stuff going on. You didn't just hop on a plane and go down to Haiti and right. do that. That just wasn't happening right. back in the 80s. That has flourished now to today. It's yeah. amazing, right? But back in the mid 80s, that was pretty uncommon. Mm -hmm. I went down to Bolivia for a summer, fell in love with it, and just took picture, 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 came back and put a slideshow together, spoke at churches, spoke at Sunday school classes, added music to it. I mean, I just love that sense of storytelling yeah. with still images. I didn't know I was going to eventually fall in love with, you know, moving images like, but it just wasn't a, an option really at the time um, when I was in high school. So did you decide I'm going to go to college and I'm going to major in something like this so I can tell stories? How, how did you decide where to go and what to major? At first, I thought I was going to be an anthropologist. On that same trip I was down in Bolivia, um, I got to spend some time with a very semi-nomadic tribe. And so I, I fell in love with that whole Bible translation and living with the tribe and all that. And I went to a college that I studied linguistics. Did not enjoy that at all. It was an <laughs> awful experience. I struggle with Spanish, you know. So... But while I was in college studying linguistics, I was working in the AV department of the library. And I'm loving that. I'm setting up gear. I'm setting up projectors to show films and classes. And I'm filming some interviews for professors and stuff. All that I loved. And then that's when I transferred to Huntington then in 1986 and became a communication major at that point. Terrific. And um, when you graduate, what do you decide to do? I, was going to, I went to grad school. And so I went out to uh, out east to study cinematography and filmmaking, and and I really felt the the need at that point, again, early 90s now, late 80s, early 90s, that I wanted to be a part of whatever was happening in the cinematic world for um, you know faith-based filmmaking. Where did you go? I went to Regent University oh. in Virginia Beach. No kidding. And I got a degree in cinematography and um, television at that play at, at Regent. It was a good degree. I got exposed to a lot of. Uh, good storytelling techniques and some technology and everything. And then I took a class, which changed my life. I took a class on teaching communication at the undergraduate level, and I loved it. And this is, I love, I come from a family of preachers and teachers. And I, I want to, I kind of like this. I, I also want to make movies and tell stories about it. So that's when God opened up doors for me to like transition more into education and and I've never been a, you know, there's that whole thing, well, those that can do and those that can't teach, I don't, you can't do that in the arts. No, you have you to have be You have to be a practitioner of the craft in order to be a good teacher. Right. And so that's what I've done my whole life. I've, I've always had side projects, passion projects, started my own production company on the side to just stay fresh and to keep the creative juices flowing. And Where did you teach first? First, I was at Anderson University. I worked in Res Life. I adjuncted there for a while. And then after a couple of years, doors opened up here. And then in how, how did you get your doctorate? What, what did you do and where'd you go? Well, I didn't understand that whole tenure and promotion thing as a new faculty member. So then after five or six years here, they're like, hey, Lance, you need to get your 
doctorate. So that I went online and got my doctorate through Regent University, spent a couple summers out there, and it was in, it was in communication. Uh, it was a little more broader topic, but I did focus on uh, narrative, narrative television text and focused on some dramatic television and how that um, you can combine um, the supernatural um, with good narrative and how that influences audiences and everything, so. Mm. Uh, when I was a teaching pastor at Black Hawk Ministries, our paths crossed if they had to cross first on yeah. a basketball court. And uh, we connected immediately. And I kept telling you, I want to have one of my four girls <laughs> come to Huntington University and to major in communications with you. And number one, played softball at Anderson, and she's a nurse practitioner now, so she probably went where God led yeah. her. And uh, Kelsey, and then Kelsey, two. we started recruiting her early. <laughs> oh man, I, I saw t potential in Kelsey. Let's let's. What would it take to get Kelsey? And, and she just blossomed in our digital media arts side of the program mm -hmm. and, and, and broadcast media. And is, and she always had that passion to. Well, she kind of did the same thing. She wanted to coach, and use her communication skills. And then she tied that into counseling. Yes, it's been exciting to see how God has used all those areas in her life. And it really is. we just really enjoyed her as a student here at the university. She came in and was a real game changer for us. She loves this place. She loves you. You've been so influential in our lives. Um, Got to film her wedding. Oh, oh that, was, was that was awesome. So epic. That was I remember, so epic. <laughs> I remember you're, you're at the reception and I do my David Lee Roth thing. Oh, and, I and, caught it. And I said, Lance, do you want me to pay you? <laughs> <'Cause>, <laughs> not to show that. <laughs> quick, quick payment. Quick payment means lasting friendship. So I remember you're 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 uh, filming something uh -huh. and on the on the dance floor, and you're filming, and I said, "Do you want me to pay you tonight?" And you go, "Oh no, we're having way too much fun." <laughs> <laughs> A moment in reception filmmaking history. <laughs> Well, you're one of a kind, but Mary was there that night. How did you meet Mary Feaster? We met at a Blackhawk Christian School homecoming because she's also a Blackhawk alumnus, and um, we connected at a homecoming. We didn't, weren't in the same class. She's a couple years younger than me, but I showed up at a homecoming. She came back to a homecoming. I saw this beautiful brunette across the room, and I kind of knew who she was, and we struck up a conversation and started going out not too long after that. Praise the Lord. Um, and she's now a counselor as well, right? She's a therapist now too, went through the graduate program here at Huntington and same one Kelsey went through. Mm -hmm. Matter of fact, I don't know if they even, they possibly graduated together. I don't remember, but they, 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 pair, they, they took some classes, classes together. together. Mm -hmm. So how do you transition from communications to filmmaking specifically? The transition to filmmaking was one that I had in the back of my mind for a while. When I first started teaching here at Huntington in 1993, there were very few colleges in America that had a film program because you were actually oh. using film equipment that actually had film, mm -hmm. like the real deal. Mm -hmm. And that's expensive. It's about $400 a roll for 10 minutes of film to buy the can, the canister of film. And we're talking 16 millimeter. We're not talking the 35, the big stuff, to then process it. That's expensive, $400 a roll. Well, videotape, you know, back then it was VHS or SVHS. You know, you could buy a two-hour VHS or SVHS for 10 bucks. So we didn't have film at the time. And I came into Huntington when we had this, this, this incredible studio we're in right now with our control room. The audience can't see all that, but we're in a really neat studio with a radio station nearby. This was all pretty much brand new back then. And started to slowly introduce uh, storytelling te story technique through some of the more traditional uh, multi-camera classes mm -hmm. and everything. Then back in 1998, we offered a film studies major. And then skip ahead, 2005, we were able to finally launch our film production major. But the technology, we had to wait till the technology was really ready to mm. do that. And today you have animation and, and what else? We have an incredible program in animation, film production, film studies, and broadcast media. So kind of four legs to the table that all form a digital media arts center. And that's a part of our School of the Arts. And so in the greater School of the Arts, you know, it's, it's so much overlap now, as you know. 
um, your show, you know, the opening logo to Restoration Road, that was animated. There's some graphic design there. You've got music that comes in play. You've got montage and editing. And so all the elements of the School of the Arts kind of t kind of cross pollinate with each other. Yeah. And as the Associate Dean of the School of the Arts, I'm, I'm more and more excited now to see how I can get the students to talk to each other in various programs to find projects oh, to yeah. together and so forth. And what takes place at your Peoria, Arizona uh, campus? Very similar to what we have here, the Peoria, Arizona Center for, it is our School of the Arts out there. And so we have film, broadcast, animation out there, about 150 students out there at this time. And that's And I'm pretty sure exciting. that the schedule demands that you're there in the winter. I, yes, for some reason, there's this <laughs> calling that January, I need to be out there. You know, and I haven't gotten President Emberton to agree that I just stay out there for through, you know, we March. Need to, we need but to work on that. As it grows, I'm sure she'll see the light for that. Well, you had an idea for a short film, uh, Gift of Hope. Uh, can you walk us through um, how that idea came to fruition and how you put all the pieces together and then the awards that it received? Yeah, The Gift of Hope is a short film that we um, partnered with um, the Youth for Christ. Um, Youth for Christ actually came to us. Dave Ron was very involved with Youth for Christ at the time and also was one of our outstanding faculty here. And he had gone across the nation and it interviewed about 80 Youth for Christ um, volunteers, uh, directors at various campuses, and we're talking inner city, rural, and approached us, uh, would you guys be willing to make a short film on one of these stories? So we had 80 stories to comb through. Oh my. And, and they're amazing stories, right? And we, and we, so we kind of flipped the classroom, gave out all these stories, to the students in the classroom, and they started writing scripts and writing treatments. And out of about, we narrowed it to about 12 stories. And out of those 12, one really popped out about an inner city story of a, of a mother that was a drug dealer using her kids to sell drugs. And how this young girl, who we'll call Sydney, that's her name in the film, had to make a choice. Do I follow mom's path? Or do I choose Christ? Mm. And and this this young girl, who's a young girl in my movie, is now a Youth for Christ director today in in the Midwest. I'll keep it anonymous at this point, but um, just loving on kids. But that was her story. So we we approached her. Could you know she had given the story in writing. We approached her from a film standpoint. Can we tell your story? She gave us the go-ahead, we wrote a script about that, set it in circa 1969 to kind of take away. Because oh. at the time that we made this film, a few years ago, her mom was still actively in the drug trade. Um, and and so she didn't want to expose her mom, and her mom was in and out, in and out, you know, and it wasn't, I don't, you know, we're not, we're not talking Breaking Bad drug dealer going on here, okay? We're talking prescription meds and that kind of stuff that was illegal to be selling and, um, so we protect, set it circa 1969. And then we just kind of rallied the whole department around it. It was a point in our program, we'd, we'd, we'd been shooting student films for about eight years, and now we wanted to up it and really do a pro scale size production value with it. And it was the year that we were able to buy our first pro camera, which is the red camera. Mm -hmm. And you remember that, yeah, right? Yeah, I do. And, and, and I think it was folks like you and others that, that saw value in what we were doing and helped support that. And so we were able to shoot this on the same camera that Peter Jackson shot all the Lord of the Ring films on and all these other great big films. We had that camera, you know? And oh, what a joy it was to utilize a pro piece of equipment and um, told this beautiful story, hired all professionals in the key position. So we Did you hired, bring in a Duck Dynasty videographer? We brought the director of photography from Duck, oh, director of photographer from Duck Dynasty, yeah, Jim Moore, and, and, uh, and we, we wanted the keys to be people, the key people in all the positions, you know, think um, audio and camera and producing and the sound and post-production and, all the key, costume, hair, makeup, all that. They were professionals out of the Chicago, LA, you know, area. And then they mentored down the line. And so we surrounded them with students and they all had to know, you're coming in to mentor. So it slowed production down a little bit. Mm -hmm. And out of it came a, a really beautiful little story, which um, we were very happy with. And then Youth for Christ was able to use that in their, 
you know, in their clubs and stuff. Um, Your and sets were amazing. The set design was was beautiful, um, and we we did a lot of research on what it would look like in the '60s. Um, what, what poverty might look like back, that's when, um, especially in the Midwest and Kentucky, and this kind of takes place in Kentucky-ish, um, people would just use old newspapers to put up as wallpaper and stuff, and that was very common, and that's what we have in one of our scenes. And, and uh, it was highly acclaimed, so you... Won several awards, I mean, national what did awards. It, win? it It won um, a broadcast educator, a top faculty film in the nation against hundreds of schools and everything and it was a collaborative effort for sure and uh it, it just it was in many film festivals and it yeah it did really really well and i'm happy about that part but i'm also i was just so happy with the story and the story that it told and how that it and, you know in your whole show is about restoring right restoration road in your book street smart you know you talk about how that people are making choices you know and it's about the book of proverbs but Proverbs is filled with just stories about characters making, you know, so conflict, you know, forces a choice, right? Choice creates change. Change then influences your community. Yep. Community then creates, creates conflict. conflict. I, I didn't get that perfectly right, but it's, yeah, it's, I this, think it's, cycle dead on, brother. it's this cycle that you talk about. And that's, that's the heart of good storytelling and, and narrative storytelling. So in our film, The Gift of Hope, we've got this, the central character, our protagonist, having to make this choice. Um, she chooses, what I think is wisely, <laughs> not to follow the path of her mom. Interesting enough, uh, I heard from the Sydney character that said her mom did find Christ. Oh, and my is, goodness. And is getting Rachel. out of the drug trade and has turned complete 180. And um, so it's a beautiful ending to that real-life story. and um, Almost requires another film. I think so, and so we might follow it up with that um, at some point. But yeah, that 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 film, The Gift of Hope, really launched, I think, the legitimacy of our film side of our program here, and kind of put us on the map when it came to what are you thinking about studying film, both at a secular level and at a Christian film school level. Well, just uh, I think a year ago at the national awards you really cleaned up, right? Huntington University against the, all these The last school. few years, we've been very fortunate to come in um, second in the nation behind Arizona State on total awards with animation, film, and broadcast. And, and we're actually first in the nation for private, you know, Christian liberal arts school. Way so to go, man. We're excited. It's exciting. And it's it's our faculty. It's our students. I mean, they're great students. Um, they, they come in ready to go. They're excited. They're You know, they've been chomping at the bit. They've been making movies and telling stories now. They're, they've grown up with cameras in their hand from the beginning, so. And you have students at Lucas Films and all kinds yeah, of places, yeah. right? We just had a student that just, is she still working on The Mandalorian? She worked on the last uh, series of The Mandalorian, you know, and and uh, it's very exciting. What are, And we have students working at churches, doing church media, which I get equally excited about. So all levels of influencing story and audiences and all for the, the glory of God Amen. is what's exciting about it. Well, what's next for the department? Just as the gift of hope was kind of a pivotal game changer in our program, um, I really feel like we now need to start looking at feature length films on the film side of our program. It's tricky to integrate that into a normal 16 week curriculum mm. um, for a semester. So we're probably looking at summers uh, to do our feature, but um, we have we have six stories in development right now. Um, my my film partner Matt Webb and my also my other film partner out in Arizona, my lead faculty out there, Phil Wilson. We're all collaborating on how can we pull this off and use students at both our centers to get involved in so f in feature filmmaking. For example, now if we need anything out in the desert, hello Arizona, we have access to all kinds of incredible yeah. locations out there. Yeah. We've got our film center out there, um, so. We're, we're, we're in that development stage. We have several stories in development. Um, we're just w waiting for what door God's gonna open up first and what direction we go uh, first. But they're all faith-affirming stories yeah. and all stories about um, redemption and you know real people that are, have real human flaws that um, have to make real choices and, and then are affirmed in their faith through the process. So that's the kind of stories we want to tell and, and ones that I think will be very um, fa family friendly 
and audience friendly as well. And faith-based films have been very successful in our culture, so it's a great They're, time to be producing them. Some of the highest grossing films in the last 10 years have been faith-based films. So uh, clearly there's an audience for it. Um, clearly people are motivated to watch them and they're inspiring to people as well. Mm. Dr. Lance Clark, thank you so much for being with us today. This has been a treat for me. It's just been fun. It's like we're sitting having a hot chocolate together. I know. Together. I love this. And let's let's keep collaborating too. Amen. What's I agree. Be. I agree. You know, the greatest storyteller ever to walk the earth was Jesus Christ. And his parables are flat out amazing. In fact, scholars who study this believe that a couple of Jesus' parables are the greatest short stories ever conceived and ever shared. And if you go to the East today, the way they teach is through stories. Um, I would encourage you to do something that Josh McDowell encouraged me to do. And I kind of dismissed it, and I didn't understand why God was prompting this guy to continue to ask me, continue to call me, and continue to prompt me and send me notes. Have you written your story? Um, I would encourage you to write your story on how God took you from a mess and began to restore you and put you back together and make you new again and use you to bring his restoration to others. And it it's probably falls in three stages, surrendering the old, our old basket case of a life, surrendering the pieces. When a car is restored, uh, a restorer will take apart the entire vehicle and restore it piece by piece. And then surrendering the new, because on this side, there'll be new tragedies and new triumphs. But every time we hit that bump in the road, it's an opportunity to go back to the one who makes things new. And I'd encourage you to write that, you know, if uh, maybe something that you could share in a six, seven minute time period or less and, and have that gem that you can pass down to future generations in your family. And then also to allow God to shape you through the process of writing your story and then to use you to bring his restoration to others as you share your story with other groups uh, in your community. Write your story, make it a goal that you will do that by the end of the year. We are Tony and Kelly Trent, and we are so excited to have you join us next week on Restoration Road.